Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Kortner is our executive producer and Anita Brockington, our engineer. Joining us this hour is a longtime visitor to 21st Century Radio, PMH Atwater. In her most recent book, Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact, we discover how near-death experiences as children affect people throughout their lives. PMH Atwater has collected hundreds of true accounts just as she did back in the 90s with her first book detailing children's account of their near-death experiences. Now, listening to adult accounts of their childhood memory of a near-death experience, Atwater describes discovered in what ways this population in general may differ from siblings and peers, what traits they may share in common, and psychic talents that often come with the experiencers are some of the topics we'll discuss this hour. Join us for a fascinating journey into the world of children's near-death experiences and how they affect people throughout their lives and what we can learn from this about living as well as dying. Thank you for joining us, PMH. Well, it's good to be here. Always a pleasure. Well, it's a ground... You forgot to mention, dear, that you were one of the people in the book. Well, I wasn't really going to say case. that, but I am. <laughs> Number 86. <laughs> I'm case 86 in this book because I had a near-death experience at the age of three. And as an experiencer, I can say it has affected my entire lifetime. So it is a groundbreaking study, what you've done. It's yes. never been done before. And explain how it is that you've sort of done this circle and why this is such an important addition to all of the literature. Well, the the... The first attempt I made, which was in the 80s and 90s, and that resulted in the, in the book, The New Children and Near-Death Experiences. And I found a number of anom- anomalies in that study. And, and I told other researchers, you know, let's get our neurologists involved. Let's get our scientists involved. This is, this is different. And th- there's nothing else like this anywhere and I couldn't get anybody interested. Nobody. So I waited a number of years, and, a, you know, it, it, it just overwhelmed me. And I got, if, if you'll pardon the expression, a little angry. And I decided, look, this has got to be done more thoroughly. And, and so I did it myself. I just, you know, I just... <laughs> Well, I'm so glad um, you did. The book is the wonderful. Of them. I did it myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people say when I've told them I had a near-death experience, they go, well, how do you remember things that long ago? Will you really know what happened to you? Well, I do, as clear as it is today. Talk to us oh, about no that. no problem with memory at all. Well, no problem, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got a woman who's 86 who remembers clearly everything that happened during her near-death experience, which happened at birth. And she's got her sister and several other people uh, alive yet today who could verify everything she said. So this woman is 86. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the, one of the really important things, because so many soldiers have near death experiences, and right. uh, there is now an effort to try to encourage them to talk with one another and therapists, because it is life altering. Um, maybe Absolutely. you could share with us some of the the general kinds of trends and tendencies that happen to near death experiencers as children, um, and what those qualities are that show up in throughout the lifetime. Well. Let's be specific here. I was going after birth to the age of five. Okay. So I was going after the tiny ones, the little ones. Right. Not the older children, but those that were very, very young. And um, I went after them with a fury in the sense that I wanted to know, um, I wanted to know the answer to a very simple question. Because, um, you know, I, I went after the, 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 the tiny ones when they were still tiny. Yeah. When the, in the 80s and 90s. But this time, the second study, I went after those that w- were more mature, or the older people in their 70s and 60s and 80s and so forth. And I said to them, you know, you know once they had verified their experience with, with other people, then I said to them... Um, did this experience, 
when you were so very small. Did this make any difference in your life? If it did, what? And so what I got back, in essence, was essays. Um, but the essays were long. They were involved, many of them with great details. I had one guy who had just um, retired. He was in his late 60s, and he wrote me literally a book. It was over 50 pages. His essay was over 50 pages. It included photographs of his family even, and he was just, just overwhelmed with the fact that for the first time in his life, mm -hmm. he could talk about what happened to him, and it was okay. And he just went on and on and on. Many of the, um, um, uh, the essays that I got back were so tear-stained, I could hardly read them. Because people were crying. Somebody cared. And they went on and on and on and on. Many times I would go back to the parents and check again and again and again. Or I'd go back to the brothers and sisters or other people because it was so phenomenal. And what I found this time was that if you have that experience when you're very, very tiny, that makes a difference that no other age can, can meet. Um, what I mean by that is th th what, what I call the power punch of a near-death experience is happening to people who are so small or even maybe a little older but still, you know, they have no before. So it's happening when the when the when the uh, when the brain is laying, or or at least the groundwork is being laid in the brain, for the brain mind assembly, for the nervous system, for the digestive system, and skin sensitivity, and and so it's coming at a time when these kids are, and with such force that these kids are being flipped. They're, they're, they're literally being flipped. The, the brain and everything is being flipped. So we have after effects no other age has. So the older children, the teens and tweens, the adults, don't have all of the kind of after effects or certainly the power of the after effects that the tiniest of the tiny do. Yeah, well, I know for me, then, at the age of three, as yeah. I almost drowned and had this out-of-body experience and met the Blessed Mother who saved my life, and, you know, it, it goes on and on, but I became like a child. When I was a child, I thought everybody could see other spirits, other people talk to the dead. I mean, these were all after effects, I believe, from my dear near-death experience, that it kind of, and this is pretty consistent in your book, that people end up with talents and skills and capacities that other people don't have. Have, naturally, they can develop them. Um, but the other thing is that there's also sensitivities. And you, when I read your list, I went, Mine, that, that's a checklist of my life. Sensitive to noise, sensitive to sound, sensitive to crowd, sensitive to light, sensitive about food, sensitive to touch. Uh, you know, and it go, and that's what you found, right? The consistency of phenomena Absolute that near deathers have. Of all those mm -hmm. plus exactly plus, dear. These people come back smarter than the average child. Let me give you a few figures here. Please do. Mine works different than before, 84%. A significant um, enhancement of intellect, let's go from the age of, of six under, so those from six under, when they were old enough to take the standard IQ test, 81%, get this, 81% were scoring between 150 to 160. That's genius. Now those from birth to the age 15 months, especially if they had a dark light experience instead of a bright light experience, their intelligence 
jumped with those same figures, 150 to 160, but higher, 81%. Well, I've already done the 81%, but with the kids, scores began at 180, um, 180 and above all of them. All of them that I, I, I was able to find. So this is from birth to the age of 15 months, especially if they had a dark light experience instead of a bright light experience. I had a bright light, by the way. We're scoring between, hmm. well, the, uh, uh, we're, we're scoring from 180 and above, 81%. Uh, well, all of them, all of them were doing that. And, and it just floored me. It just floored me. And also the fact that most of them were were dealing with um, most of them were abstracting now and abstracting before the first grade. Now let me give you an example of abstracting. This is a little boy, he's six years old. He's in uh, first grade, uh, um, a little bit above the capital city of Georgia. I forget the name of the city right now. Um, he was in school in the first grade. He drowned about halfway through the school year. So they were able to bring him back, and he went through, you know, a lot of medical issues and those kinds of things. When he was finally able to get back to school, he went up to the school teacher. And and this boy, when he was able to get back, he's reading... Greek mythology and understands it, he goes up to his teacher and he says, why was the book Robinson Crusoe ever written? This kid is abstracting. I mean, what schools in the United States are prepared for a first grader who can abstract? And and, and, and that's, that's not the half of it. Many of them has have stenesthesia. Stenesthesia is an, uh, an elaboration in the limbic system in the brain. I can give you another example of stenesthesia. And there's many types of stenesthesia. Uh, but, uh, but mostly it is multiple or um, different kinds of sensing. So let me give you an example. This is me. No, I'm not a near-death kid, but I was born with anesthesia. So in the first grade, I was the only child in school who could smell color, see music, and hear numbers. Mm -hmm. You see the difference in the limbic system? For sure. And how I was operating? Yeah. I, I was, you know, I was perfectly honest, but everybody thought I was lying. Mm -hmm. So I spent most of the first grade... Uh, on a tall stool in front of the class wearing a tall conical hat that said dunce on it. Right. As an example of a bad child who told lies. Right. The principal tried, tried twice uh, to kick me out of school, brought, you know, brought my mother in and, and went through big issues with my mother. And by the time the first grade was over, I knew I was telling the truth. I knew I was a good kid and I was telling the truth, but everybody else thought I was bad and that I was a liar. So at the end of the first grade, I became so angry that I decided that when I grew up, I was never going to be an adult because adults are stupid. Oh, we should have met when we were children. I had the yeah. same opinion. <laughs> We'd have gotten along perfect. <laughs> and no authority was any authority but my own. I mean, that's a, there's so many interesting um, qualities uh, that a, that become the pattern of operating the world as adults I, once we've had the near-death experience as children. I want to come back to some of those. We do have to take a break. But when we come back, I'd like to talk about some of those patterns, whether it's how they dealt with authority or what their health is like, um, the kinds of careers they go to, the, the choices that they make about what's important and what's not. We'll be right back. Our guest 
Excuse me. Our guest is PMH Atwater. Her book is The Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact, a Bear & Company 2019 release. And you can learn more at her website, www.pmhatwater.com. First caller at 410-922-6680, that's 1-800-WCBM-680, who knows the name of our guest this hour, will be a winner of her book, The Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact, a Bear & Company 2019 release. Hello, this is Lisa Smart, author of Words at the Threshold. You can learn more about me and my work at www.finalwordsproject.org. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Zoe is a well-informed and thoughtful interviewer. What a pleasure it was to speak with her this evening about the mystery and magic of final words. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Don't forget, all of our shows are archived online. Our podcasts are free. You can subscribe to 21st Century Radio YouTube channel and catch all the shows you miss. We have a winner who understood and knew that our guest this hour is PMH Atwater. Dr. Atwater's newest book, The Forever Angels, is a Bear & Company 2019 release, and you can learn more at her website, www.pmhatwater.com. So coming back, PMH, to what you found in terms of consistency Consistency among this population who between the age of infancy and five years of age had a near-death experience, how it affected them throughout their lives, not just in school, but in marriage, in relationships, in the way in which they view the world. So give us some of the other commonalities that you found. Well, um, one of the things that really distinguishes them, most of them come back uh, or go on being very interested in math, science, and history. They're very drawn to that. They're very drawn to education or somehow becoming um, credentialed in either math, science, or history. You don't find that with the older kids. You don't find that with adults. Most of those uh, become psychics, maybe mediums, maybe healers maybe artists, uh, on and on and on. But with these tiny ones, they want to find out more about the earth, more about people, more about what makes the earth plane work. Um, what I've noticed with these, with these uh, people is there's... They're very, very interested in what it is to be a human being. Now, bear in mind, they're coming in from light. And, and they're suddenly being dropped into this world. And, and they have no idea at all about what it is to be a human being. I mean, just that concept isn't there at all. So suddenly, they're plunked into a family, sometimes with siblings. They're plunked into friendships, school, uh, dating, um, going through the teen years and and um, beyond, and getting a job, going to college. Uh, become uh, have a career, marrying, have children of their own and grandchildren, and 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 early on at least, and even going when they get older, this idea of being a human being in the earth plane is still a novelty. So so that takes the whole idea of the near-death experience, because most of us, when we have one, when we're older, we can make contrasts in our life. When a child cannot make a contrast, then the whole idea of life and death 
changes. The whole idea of reincarnation changes. All of these things that we call spiritual changes. Because for them, everything is light. For them, everything is spiritual. So they look at you kind of funny, maybe cross-eyed, and they can't figure out where you're coming from. And so they're growing in, in life. They're becoming a human being is a really big deal. For the, bear in mind that my, my research base for adults and children is nearly 5,000 people. In this study, we've got 397 people. That's a big study. Lots of people. Okay, so with these little ones, um, let me give you an, an example of one of them. The book is dedicated to Tracy. Tracy had her near-death experience inside her mother's womb while she was being born, while her mother was trying to commit suicide. So we've got, we've got a very strange, convoluted idea then of what life is. This child is coming in, this soul is coming in, wondering what this is all about. What I'm finding with, um, with integration, integrating the experience, the average adult takes seven to ten years to integrate their experience. Don't believe anybody who says they did it quicker because they didn't. But the average child will take 20 to 40 years to integrate their experience. Again, that's because they simply had no idea what it was to be a human being. And to find that out was really difficult for them. And I also think the the beauty of your sharing the sensitivities um, interests me a great deal because it's it's a population pool. You know there are extremely sensitive people. Twenty percent of the population are extremely sensitive. That means they're sensitive to all kinds of things. But near deathers, like I was, um, carry all these things in common. You know, right. I, I mentioned. I'm just going to list them again, and then we'll go through some of them. Light sensitivity, sound sensitivity electrical sensitivity, decreased tolerance of pharmaceuticals, um, and, and basically a different worldview in general than other people, and low blood pressure. And I actually can check on every single one of them. Sure, because you're one of them. <laughs> well, it's just so interesting to me that, that that experience should so profoundly affect the nervous system and your wiring, as you put it, to the point that it evidences itself throughout your lifetime as these challenges. It's very challenging to be in a noisy society. It's very challenging with, you know, electromagnetic radiation to exist in our computerized world. It's very challenging. And that's why I set up an alternative holistic healing center was my own experience of not being helped, but being harmed by pharmaceuticals and had to find other ways to get well from a chronic illness. And I thought that interesting also that you said 37% had consistently poor health and 67% either couldn't sleep much or had sleep issues. I had horrible sleep issues as a child and, and now right. some as well. So when you put this all together um, and you look at all these case studies that you have, 397 people, walk through some of these in terms of the way you see it now as a pattern. Well, look, 90% lost their bonding with parents or never had it to begin with. So that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. That is a huge issue. Let's begin there. 90%. That's most of them. That doesn't mean they didn't love their parents, but it does mean they didn't bond with them. So there's not that typical kinship with brothers and sisters and moms and dads. And aunts and uncles and grandpas and grandmas. It just isn't there. Uh, many of them have difficult, uh, 62% had difficult family situations. Empathic 
84% came back empathic. Yeah, that I can relate to entirely. And, of course, highly intelligent. Um, goes on. One of the big issues that really just, if you'll pardon the old-fashioned word, flummoxed me, <laughs> is 74% came back and had successful lives went on to have highly, highly successful lives. Several of them became millionaires. That's 74%. Remember that percentage. Yeah. 74% came back with strong suicide ideation. They didn't want to be here. I have a whole chapter in my book on PTSD versus NDEs. This is big. This is huge. 74% wanting to go back even if it meant suicide. We've got to look at that. Wow. The after effects of near-death states for the very young can seem similar to a form of PTSD. 34% in my study, that's 397 people, 34% were positive about having the NDE, 61% were negative about having the NDE. Well, we've, we've, got to, we've got to really see that and realize that it's all about home. Guilt for wanting to go back, that, uh, you know, they feel guilty for wanting to go back, but betrayal for getting kicked out. Many never knew or understood what a human being is or how to be one. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the biggest issue. Uh, it's what you went through. I mean, how do you live in this world when you don't function like other people in this world? And and as a young child, I remember thinking everybody could see the invisible, you know, as I mentioned, talk to the dead, hear what the animal sure. said. And I only learned, like, I guess about the time of 10 or so that, no, everybody <laughs> didn't do that. And I used to think it was people would look at me like, oh, she has such a good creative imagination. And there was another thing I thought that was really interesting that you listed about what's normal for the majority of child experiencers, which is a sense of guidance and invisible beings that are sometimes visible and much more. I mean, there's a psychic yeah. level of attunement that I know Strong I've had. Strong guidance, 76%. Strong guidance. Um, 46%, however, turned to drug use. 45% turned to alcohol. Those are also big issues. 61% are aware of the future. Um, I had a number of them say, um, you know, when they were in school and growing up, um, they often would not go out on dates. And I said, well, why not? And then they said, well, well we knew what was going to happen before we, before we left. <laughs> so why go? <laughs> if you already know what's going to happen, why go? And so that became an issue. You also, you know, you pointed out there's also the possibility of out-of-body out travels, um, cleverness, inventiveness, a need, a need to help others heal, which, of course, I went ahead and started a holistic healing center, and so have many others who had near-death experiences that I know of. And so it's it's just so interesting to me that, that these that that experience well for me it was you know an out of body and an altered state and coming in contact with the invisible realms of the healing angels um that it it shifts your perception so that your life has to be different than other people's right right you can you can you cannot live your life like the average person does you're different and and so you find ways of handling that difference so that you can somehow blend in or find a life for yourself that is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And that that's their challenge. Um, in in my study, 
um, you know, again, 397 people, but they're all over the world. They're different places. They're different kinds of people. Like three of them were raised in the voodoo religion. So they never heard of the Bible, never heard of Christianity, never heard of Jesus. All voodoo. And in all three cases, each one was met in death by Jesus. They knew who Jesus was, and they called Jesus by name. Now, how do you explain that? I can't explain that. But it happened. Another one that that really grabbed me was um, I also ran across a number of um, children. The only reason their parents brought them into this world was was so the parents would have a baby they could sacrifice on Satan's altar. They were Satanists. And the, and the one, Judy, I talk about in the book, you'll be especially interested in Judy's case. She had 17 near-death experiences by the age of 10. Wow. The first one was at six weeks of age. Now, what she went through in, in finding out who she was, why she was here, and, 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 and being able to live in this world successfully is just, is just awesome, absolutely awesome. And, um, and I would like to read to you her, um, what she has to say. She says, all my experiences in this life, whether they appear to be dark or light, are expressions of love, experiences of searching for love. I came into this life with a purpose. This was not known to me until much later in my life. Or, get the or here, or I would would not have been able to truly know the experiences as they were in the moment. What I know today has brought everything full circle. This woman has has been able to forgive her parents. Can you imagine? Well, that's a blessing for all. (laughs) Near-death experiences by the age of 10. All of them were violent. Mm, Tragic. But the forgiveness is the beauty. We'll be right back. Our guest is Dr. PMH Atwater. Her book, The Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact, a Bear & Company 2019 release. And learn more at www.pmhatwater.com. Hello, this is Tammy Billups, holistic healer for animals and their people, author of Soul Healing with Our Animal Companions, and producer of the CD created to complement the book called Soul Healing Meditations to Benefit Animals and Their People. You can learn more about me and my products and virtual healing practice at TammyBillups.com. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio and our guest, Dr. PMH Atwater. Her book, The Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact of Bear & Company 2019 release. Remember, all of our shows are free podcasts online. You can subscribe to 21st Century Radio YouTube channel. You can find us online at www.21stcenturyradio.com. So, PMH, when we look again at some of the commonalities between um, all of these cases that you're 397 cases of people who had near-death experiences as children and remember them well enough to articulate and describe what their life has been like. You found other commonalities, and one of them I thought was so interesting, which was not only courage, but the sense that there's a solution to everything which I've always believed, like I don't believe there's any problem we can't solve. It's just a question of attention and intention. What are some of the other qualities of the nature of this group of people? Well, you know, in in general, 
See, these people tell us that there is an ongoing stream of consciousness, that past, present, future are but one continuous reality, that time does not exist, and that consciousness itself moves from one dimension to another in a continuous and forever opportunity for all of us to be the forever angels we already are. Now, imagine that, and I know you can. You have that as your reality. You have that as truth for you. So therefore, the rest of the world needs some reinterpretation. It, it needs some way to turn around and twist around and maybe go up and upside down for you to figure out why everybody else feels and thinks the way you, they do. Um, it, it's strange to you. So for them, it takes a little longer for them to kind of figure out why the rest of the world is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Often they're bullied in school. Um, some of them are, are really kind of lost until they figure it out. And, and their figuring, again, goes back to redefinition. Uh, the idea of math and science and history, that's how they redefine. I've got a whole chapter in the, in the book on historical cases. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about those, particularly Abraham yeah. Lincoln's, Albert Einstein. I mean, Let's you've go got there. Albert Einstein. All right, go right ahead. You've got Mozart. Um, Black Elk. You've got a whole bunch of, of scientists. You've got Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey did not have his gifts and talents until after he drowned at the age of five. That's when they came. In current time, if you want to look at his history, it is, it is Benedict Cumberbatch, the actor from England. He just matches exactly a child experiencer of a near-death state Point for point for point for point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an um, amazing group. You have Abraham Lincoln's, Albert Einstein's, Walter Russell, Marcel Vogel, who we knew personally, um, you know, who developed the whole resonance system for the right. for the disk systems we used to use in our computers. I mean, the list is all, is long. It can go on and on and on. Um, and also this. This whole idea of breathing, I, I just hope and pray that a lot of people get this book so that they can learn more ab about the life they think they know. And breathing is one of them. Um, I, I get a real kick out of kids when, they're, um, when they talk about the other side and this side, they say, well, everything yeah, is, is breath. Everything is breathing, but not as your nose does. And this I've noticed with children again and again for, for decades and decades, even with my own children. Um, like, like, for instance, swimming pool or lake. The average child will just walk down into that lake. They'll walk down into their, into their water. And they have no sense of any um, problem at all. It's the parents that, that get crazy and, and jump in and try to save their child. The child is still breathing under the water for quite a while. And... Uh, and uh, I begin to notice this with adults after their near-death experience. They, they would go through periods of time when they were not breathing, but everything was fine. 
you know, they're driving, they're thinking, they're going through their life, but they're not breathing. And maybe these periods of time will be five minutes at a time, eight minutes at a time, maybe ten minutes at a time. This is happening to me, too. And uh, it happened to me for a whole year. And I just couldn't figure out why. Well, thanks to this book and a fall I took, um, I, I was out pruning the top of a crepe myrtle tree, and and the feeling was it, it's time to get down. You know, you're reaching too far. Get down off the ladder. So I started to get down off the ladder, and I flew. I didn't fall. I flew um, a, a big distance, landed on the lawn, and the lawn had just been watered, so it was soft and easy. I was not a hurt. And, and I became aware of the fact that my body was breathing, but my nose wasn't working. My lungs weren't working. The shock was too great. Nothing was working, but I was breathing, but I wasn't breathing uh, the normal way at all. And I came to discover that it's the vagus nerve. Uh, And it's the vagus nerve that I now believe is the physical counterpoint to the silver cord because it's the job of the vagus nerve to gather up all the blood in your body and pool it around the heart. It is the job of the vagus nerve when you're threatened to force air into the brain and the parts of the body that are vital. It's the vagus nerve that does that automatically. It takes over. It takes you over. And if you don't cooperate you will faint because the vagus nerve insists on taking over. It will force air, and it will force blood pooling. And I put the two and two together and thought, wow, this is what's happening. The vagus nerve is taking over and assuring that you can breathe no matter what happens even when the nose and the lungs are not working. So when we look back at not only your own experiences and those of these wonderful people who have participated in your study, that's the content of the Forever Angels, near-death experiences in childhood and their lifelong impact. The other thing you talk about is the different ways in which um, near-deathers seem compelled to participate in the world as if they have a mission, even if it changes all the time, but that there's, um, I guess, a great deal of concentration and effort that goes into doing whatever the doing of is. Yeah, they they, they just take over like you did. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessarily a mission. It was that drive inside of you, that knowing inside of you, that essence inside of you that says... You know, you've got to understand this and that and the, and and this over here. Mm-hmm. You have to redefine the world because if you don't, you can't live in it. So you're redefining it and you're sharing that with others and you're teaching others how to redefine it. That's what these children do. It's, it's not uh, what we do as adults when we use that beautiful world mission. For them, it is life. It is how they understand life. It is what they do because for them, doing that makes life real. You also mentioned that love changes for certain experiences, meaning it's normal for them. To, you mentioned earlier the parent-child bonding. And, and that there can also be a sort of um, a quiet or very apparent sense of loneliness in this group of humans. Yes, very lonely. Right. Um, the typical, typical characteristics afterward, heightened senses, vivid imagination, 
intellectual curiosity and drive, psychic, intuitive, but lonely. Higher IQ. I'm, I mean, <laughs> um, what's it like to be around others when you already know what's going to, going to happen for the most part before it does? That's you so know, interesting. How do you explain that to anybody else? It, well, for me, you know, reading your book was like reading a little checklist of my life. And so now I'm sure. thinking, boy, I would love to hang out with some other near-deathers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. We'd have a wonderful time together because we'd all be experiencing very similar qualities, different ways it manifests in our lifetime. But I think you've added such a wonderful, beautiful contribution to this literature. I mean, now that the near-death experience is becoming culturally acceptable and medically recognizable and being collected by more and more people, your work makes it important for people to understand to pay attention when a child has had a near-death experience. I go deeper into it than most do. Yeah. Right. And I go after validation. It's not just stories. I want to validate it. I want to see them. I want to talk to them. Um, I want to get deeper. I want essays. Um, I, I want more more stories. I want to get deeper into the story. Remember, I'm a cop's kid. I was raised in a police station. So we'll have to encourage you to continue the work because we're out of time. PMH Atwater, you did a beautiful job again on a new book, The Forever Angels, Near-Death Experiences in Childhood and Their Lifelong Impact, Bear & Company 2019 and www.pmhatwater.com.